Welcome to Animals Voice Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McKenzie, and very excited to have back for, I think, the third time. We think so, yes. Uh, yes, Dave Wilson, Director of Shelter Health and Wellness for the Ontario SPCA, retired vet. Uh, welcome. It's, it's great to be back. It was fun the other uh, other couple of times when we did this. I'm, I'm hoping to have some more uh, some more interesting times today. We always have fun together. I actually mentioned to my producer, Emily, uh, and Emily can vouch for this. I hope she will. Uh, that favorite, one of my favorite people in the building, none other than Dave Wilson. Didn't I say that, Emily? Yes. There, she said, yeah, see? So I'm not making stuff up. <laughs> Stop hitting me. So, so, and I uh, usually wonder if I owe you money when you're saying No, like I say nice things about you because, because it's nice to be nice to the nice. Ah. Wow, that's a... See how we did that? Yeah, thing? I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get right down to it. Enough of this tomfoolery. Uh, we, we get questions from our listeners and uh, people that follow us on social media about parvo. Mm-hmm. Parvo is the name of, I guess, an illness that we hear about at times uh, within the shelter environment. So we thought, who better to talk to about this than you? So in, in layman's terms, what, what's parvo? It, uh, great first question, absolutely. Um, so parvo is short for parvovirus, and, and it is just that. It is a virus uh, that affects dogs, um, and it affects dogs of any age, any breed. Um, and well, I, mean, I know we'll get a little bit, bit, bit further into it, but um, it's just it's very, very common still in spite of some of the protection measures that are available to uh, to owners and to clients, actually. So I mentioned that people uh, ask about this, and we hear about it in the shelter environment, but really it's not confined to the shelter environment. What are some of the symptoms that pet owners can look for uh, to catch this illness early on? So, I mean, w- one of the things that the some of the earliest stages is that the dog seems for want of a better term, a little off. They're a little bit dumpy. Uh, a lot of times the first thing that happens is their appetite kind of fades. Um, they may feel warm or if the you know happen, the owners happen to be taking their temperature, they start by running a low to medium grade fever. Um, and, and the dogs are just kind of depressed. They're, they're just, you know, kind of not their usual energetic selves. Uh, they just seem to be, people will a lot of times say at the earliest stage, they remember thinking the dog was under the weather. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of little common terms, and that's just at the earliest stages. And then uh, some of the more severe uh, clinical signs start to form, start okay. to develop. What are some of those more severe clinical signs? Um, usually the, the virus attacks the lining of the gut um, and destroys it is, is really what it is. Uh, the, the best uh, kind of example I heard once was that it's, it's similar to taking a razor blade to a sheet of velvet. Um, and that's really what the virus does, is it literally cuts off uh, the lining, which is almost like a velvet lining uh, that they have in their gut, that we have in our gut as well. Um, and it literally cuts off that lining uh, about halfway down. And the lining of the gut is similar to little microscopic tiny fingers. And so it's like cutting the fingers off halfway down. And then now these little fingers are oozing, and they're oozing fluid, and they're oozing blood. And so then what you tend to see is bloody diarrhea and or bloody vomit oh, wow. um, and a lot of pain because you can understand that, you know, having this happen to the lining of your gut and a lot of diarrhea and the spasms and everything that goes along with that is extremely painful for the dog. And then it doesn't just a low to medium grade fever. Usually they spike uh, a very high fever as well. Okay. Wow. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's, that's very sad to think of that happening. I've, I've got two dogs and, you know... Uh, you just think about okay, got to keep an eye on that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, make sure that you don't see those signs at all. What what um, what causes this to spread? Like, how is this virus spread? So there's a word we're going to introduce uh, introduce you and introduce the audience to, and and it's a word called fomites. F O M I T E S. Uh, fomites stands for it's any inanimate object or surface that can transfer or that can carry um, a, basically a virus. And parvo can be spread directly from dog to dog, yes, absolutely, but it doesn't need that. Uh, it actually can be spread, the virus can be just in the environment, um, you can meet and greet a dog, 
uh, that uh, since the parvovirus can be shed uh, usually in their stool, if the dog is licking themselves, if there isn't a lot of hand washing, and depending on where you're touching the dog, you can carry the virus on you. We can carry it on our hands. We can carry it on our, our clothing. Um, or it can be transferred on food bowls, on utensils. It can be transferred on surfaces. And the, one of the worst things about this virus is that it can live in the environment. When I say live, it can survive for uh, up to to over a year, anything from a year to a year and a half are wow. best estimates. And it can survive freezing. So people think, well, if I can just get through the winter, parvo will go away. And that's not true. The thing that really kills it is drying out. And so honestly, our best winter to get rid of parvo is one that has very little snow, with a lot of cold and very dry air. And that's what will dry out and kill the virus. If we get a heavy snow cover, the virus is protected and it's right there next spring, ready to go again, unfortunately. Wow. So, I, f I mean, I feel like you just answered my next question, which was, uh, can your dog get parvo directly from another dog? So based on the answer you just gave, if I'm taking my dog to the dog park and they're playing and wrestling and, and uh, tussling around, I mean, they can transfer from animal to animal that way, in addition to me carrying it if I'm not washing my hands enough or cleaning at the house enough. So it sounds like we need, you need to be very on top of that sort of thing. Well, that and, and what can make it worse is that the dogs at the early stage of the illness, before the dog is even showing signs, in other words, the dog appears to be perfectly normal, mm -hmm. he can still be shedding virus, producing virus in his stool. And so the thing is, since this virus can survive for so long, you have a dog that's, let's say, in the dog park that is behaving perfectly normally, that has a bowel movement, and even the people come and they clean it up, what's left behind could have parvovirus in it. Your dog goes over, sniffs it, licks their nose, steps in it, and there's nothing really there for you to see, but just walks in it, and then later on they happen to be grooming and they lick their own feet, and now the virus is inside them. So, you know, people think, well, um, you know, if I hose down the, the area or if I wash down the grass or if I pick up, I clean up the diarrhea, that'll take care of it. There's still virus left behind. And since it can last for, you know, a year, year and a half, that spot, you can walk over a patch of grass that appears perfectly normal. And if a dog with parvo, unfortunately, was shedding and uh, had a bowel movement there months ago, mm -hmm. there could still be virus left. Okay, so Dave, I'm picturing our listeners listening to this broadcast or maybe watching us and hearing all of this and now being very concerned. Sure. Taking their dog out for walks, taking their dog to the dog park, making sure their home is clean enough. Um, are there ways to prevent your dog uh, from getting, uh, from ever getting Parvo? There, well, not ever. I mean, you can't make a 100% guarantee. Mm -hmm. but, but this is why your veterinarian is, is usually at every appointment you're going into, this is why they're usually reviewing your vaccination history, mm -hmm. reviewing your vaccine status, reminding you of your dog's vaccination status, and, and then getting those vaccines and keeping them up to date and current. Because a dog that is fully vaccinated has the best chance of being fully protected to fight this virus off and to uh, basically eliminate it from, from the dog's body before it becomes an issue. Um, there are still cases where, you know, the dog's immune system, there may be problems with his own immune or his own defense system. And, and in rare cases, he may not be protected, but the vast majority, and I mean like 99% of dogs will respond to the parvovirus vaccine that is out there. It's incredibly effective. There are various ones that are produced by different companies. Um, and this is why your veterinarian, it's, you know, it, it may seem like your vet is really focused on vaccines. This is one of the reasons why they are justifiably focused on vaccines is because treating parvovirus, the occurrence, is incredibly uh, risky and expensive. So preventing it is the key, is definitely the key. Talk to me about that treatment. Like how, how do we treat parvo? Well, I mean, you think of it this way, in the, se the severe cases, you've got vomiting, diarrhea, bleeding, dehydration, a fever. You know, the dog just can't drink more water and, and cure his dehydration because he's vomiting, yeah. right? So usually this is a severe case is the vets will need to admit the dog to ICU uh, and have them on full intravenous support and a lot of medications to stop the vomiting, to stop the diarrhea spasms, to try and provide antibiotic support 
uh, because again, like I said, it's like those little fingers being cut off. We now have an open pathway for bacteria to now gain access to the bloodstream and the body. So, you know, for the severe cases, the dogs are hospitalized sometimes for several days at a time. Um, and it's not 100% guaranteed that, that we can pull the dog through this. Some okay. dogs, unfortunately, don't make it. Um, in the less severe cases, sometimes the veterinarians will treat them as an outpatient. Yeah. But this is really where, if unfortunately you do have to deal with parvovirus, this is where you really want to be listening closely to your veterinarian's recommendations. It strikes me as you're talking about all of this medical treatment that I, I wonder, is, is parvo covered in different pet insurance policies? Well, it can and, be. And I'm depending. sorry to uh, you know, yeah. know, uh, jump on you with that question. We hadn't talked about that ahead of time, so yep. you didn't know I was going to hit you with that. It just strikes me that, uh, would that be something that is covered? Um, major illnesses are covered under certain policies as long as there's no, in most cases they insist on no pre-existing. Okay. And, and more times than not, um, you know, dogs, when they're having parvovirus, this is probably the first time they're having it. So most policies, and this is where you got to read that fine print right. and check yeah. with your, you know, check with your provider. We're, we're, we're guessing right now. Yeah. We're not, this is not the... But there is provide, there, provide, there is provision for it under certain policies, yes. Okay, okay. I have cats at home. If my dog got parvo, would my cats be at risk? The the best research right now is saying no. Uh, cats can get a, a parvovirus, but it's a slightly different uh, model, so to speak, uh, that infects them. And so they, they don't believe it can cross infect. And by the same token, it's, it's not a zoonotic disease, which means you cannot get parvovirus from your dog either. Okay, good. If someone suspects that their dog may have parvo based on listening to this broadcast today, what do you recommend to them that they do? You know, and it's the it's the broken record. I usually say is call your vet, call your vet, call your vet. Um, there are some incredibly accurate and very effective tests that your vet can do to see one if that is what you're most likely dealing with, mm -hmm. and how bad it may be, so that that can then you know you can have that conversation with your veterinarian about what treatment options are available to you. But you know, anytime you get a situation with with any diarrhea, you know, low grade fever vomiting, any of those things, that's where you want to be at the very least calling your veterinarian for guidance and then following their recommendations because, you know, a lot of times that's one of the things they're thinking of, what possible virus or what possible contagion has your animal encountered that they need to uh, help you deal with. Nice. Thank you for uh, joining us again today, Dave. Uh, as always, you're one of the people I credit uh, this way. When I'm in a room with you, I always leave that room having learned something. And uh, I love being around people like that. So we also love having guests like that on Animals Voice podcast. So thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you, the listeners, for tuning in, for sharing our broadcasts. We, we appreciate how involved everybody gets on social media. Please continue to share our broadcasts and, and check them out. You can contact us if you have show ideas or questions. My email address is kmckenzie at ospca.on.ca. Or you can find me on Twitter at kevthegrad. Until next time, we'll catch you later. Okay, so the first thing you're going to want to do is cut your pole. Um, so you want to use a template for whatever you're using um, for this hole. So whether it